Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to this Finagle talk. Uh, my name is Vladimir Kostikov, and um, today I'm going to give you a brief overview of what Finagle is. Um, but that's just an overview, and um, I hope it should be enough for you to figure out if Finagle is a good fit for your infrastructure, if it solves that kind of problems you're trying to deal right now. And um, yeah, that's basically it. So um, uh, who the hell am I? Um, so my name is Vladimir, I said, and uh, I've been working on Finagle for almost two years already and um, on the Finagle team at Twitter. And before that, I was doing some kind of low-level uh, stuff, working with compilers and VMs at Intel. And then um, something happened to me in 2013, and I started playing with functional programming in Scala. And um, now I finally do that full-time. And I'm actually the person who's responsible for that boring tweets from Ed Finagle on Twitter. So you, you should feel free to blame me for that um, also. All right, so um, what Finagle is anyway? Um, Finagle is an RPC system that is built and used in production at Twitter and many other companies outside Twitter as well. And it's written in Java, it works on JVM, and uh, sorry, it's written in Scala and it works on JVM, but mostly usable from Java as well. And we have a bunch of services uh, from teams uh, internally that run services in Java uh, quite successfully in Finagle. And, um, and we have this Robo Bird logo for Finagle, so it's, it wasn't named after a bird, but we have to make things equal, so we have this logo that looks like a bird, but it's a robot. Um, anyways, uh, when it comes to describing what Finagle is, I really like this Alexi tweet from the most recent um, Finagle con, and it says, uh, the key problem with Finagle adoption that it solves tons of problems you know nothing about until it's too late. And this is really interesting because um, Finagle actually solves tons of problems people don't know, um, know nothing about. And um, this is really, really, really exciting part about Finagle that usually it just works and you know nothing about what's happening underneath. It just solves problems for you like every day, every second. That's what Finagle does. Um, anyways, um, what Finagle is today? Um, it's been around quite a long time, since 2010, and with 4.5 thousand GitHub stars. It makes top seven Scala project there. And um, we've got 15 protocols implemented already, slightly more, um, including our own protocol called MAX, which stands for multiplexing. And um, it's basically, if you view that, uh, you can view that as a subset of HTTP2 because it happened way before HTTP2. And uh, so it has control messages, like low level control messages for request cancellation, session liveness detection, stuff like that, that you can successfully utilize from the Finagle side and use it quite, um, quite efficiently. And um, this is adopted quite well in, inside Twitter and a bunch of different companies outside the company um, and who run services um, using Triffmax. And um, HTTP2 and native form migration is on track and uh, moving really fast. I know we've been promising that native for utopia for about two years right now, but we are finally getting there. And this is really exciting. Um, and the last part is uh, it's important to understand what Finagle is in terms of it's not the application server, it's not the application framework. It doesn't answer your question how you would, how you would write your services. It does answer the question how you, do, how you, how you would communicate between them. And this is really important. Because of that, um, there are lots of questions Finagle doesn't answer. Like, for example, how do you define REST controller? How do you do JSON? How do you do login? And stuff like that. And um, this is why it has so many like child projects built on top of that. And to mention a few specifically designed for HTTP um, is Finatra, Finch, and Twitter server that you can actually like um, pull up and build stuff like already. It has everything you need for that. Um, <clears throat> So what Finagle is at Twitter, uh, we've got a team called Core System Libraries. Um, there are about 10 engineers so far in the team, and we maintain libraries that powers uh, Twitter distributed infrastructure. So we've got Finagle, Util, Twitter Server, Scrooge, Finatra as well, a bunch of metrics libraries. And um, we've got internal version of Finaglers and call rotation, which means that we use to provide support for internal teams 
due to these production issues in Finagle. And the last part is really interesting. So we've got mono repo and mono build, which means we always run Finagle from source, from master. And what it means for you as an open source customers is that um, when we do an open source release, we always roll out the code that has been stress tested in production for about several months and thousands of services. And this is really a good deal, I guess, for, for you as a customer. <laughs> and um, so wh what Finagle is outside to her is um, really interesting as well because so many companies and teams trying to clone that functionality that we've built. And this is a tweet from um, about a new fork written in C++ from, from uh, Facebook. And I'm also aware of one clone from Dropbox written in Rust. And I personally don't know about Java 8 clone, but I wouldn't be surprised if that one exists already. So people actually trying to copy that in 2016, technology that was built in 2010. And I think it's pretty interesting because it means that we are still doing something right. <laughs> All right, before we, before we start talking about um, services and clients, that kind of abstractions, let's talk about the um, big picture up as well. So um, Finagle is designed with this simple idea in mind that your server is a function um, um, and the function from request to future response. And the most, so in the meaning that you can you can talk to a server using that function by just calling it. And you can define your server by implementing that function. And the interesting part here is that those rec and wrap type params, it means that um, the server is abstracted over the protocol it's used by. In, and it means that you can define most of the um, generic functionality um, using just this abstraction, like retries, load balancing, and stuff like that. And you can share it across different uh, protocol and implementation. And this is exactly what we do in Finagle. <clears throat> and so this picture, basically, it's how Finagle looks like internally. So we've got this stack thing on the left, which is a Finagle stack, and Nati pipeline on the right, if you know what Nati is, is IO library for JVM. And we've got transport in between that sort of like glues them together. And this is really interesting because um, on the left side, there is like um, a, a functional service-oriented abstraction that is built by composition. And on the right side, there is like event-based, low-level, high-performance native pipeline. Um, and the transport sort of like glues them together. Um, yeah, and in this talk, we will mostly be focusing on the left part, on the stack part. And the stack is basically um, a collection of genetic models that you can fold over and build your clients or servers. Basically, you can fold over anything that is known how to compose. And we know how to compose functions so we basically know how to compose those services we've seen before. So in, in fact, what we do is we put those services inside the stack and then fold over it and we've got a client we can call or basically we can, we can get a server that we can uh, serve traffic through. Um, and that's really interesting um, functionality. And inside stack, every, every single piece inside stack, every single um, um, like generic model sort of implements um, standalone like functionality. For example, retries is a standalone stack model. For example, load balancer is a standalone stack model, and so on and so forth. And um, that picture is exactly how server looks like. But clients are slightly complicated, because they do so much work on top of just sending the request to make sure it will succeed in the least possible time. So they actually form some kind of tree of stacks with two branching points. So we've got load balancer in the very first that distribute traffic across um, um, several nodes where your software is deployed to. And we've got connection pooling that maintains a pool of connection stacks. And each stack looks exactly like we've seen on the previous slide that terminates with native pipeline. And that forms, um, that tree of stacks forms a client, sort of like slightly complicated picture, but still, still quite useful to understand. Um, and before we start talking about clients, let's talk about what they share uh, in common. And this is an interesting topic. Um, the, the problem is how you would configure clients and servers in Finagle. And we've been thinking about that a lot and uh, try to solve the problem three different times. And I hope they finally succeed here. And so why it's tricky is because the configuration API should be simple enough and uh, easy to use as well, because you want to be uh, you want to assure that common things is easy to do, but uncommon things is possible to do. And what we have today works quite well. Um, 
So configuration is always code in Finagle. Um, it's not common line flags, not config files. It means that it always type checks by your compiler and it auto completes by your IDE. And it's really useful. There is a conventional API pattern for finding an entry point into your API. So basically, you type something like http.client.this, and you see what ID suggests you, what kind of params you can overwrite on that client or server, and what you can do with that, basically. And <coughs> what we also do is we try to provide slightly different API for configuring what is known like expert level params, we think is not really safe to overwrite today, but we want to expose them because we want to experiment with them. And there is a slightly different API for this, and it's not so user friendly, it's slightly not so discoverable, which means that when you use that, you don't have, you're not having a good time, which is basically the kind of nice message we can send to user, if you're not having a good time, you're probably doing something wrong and dangerous. And the new API is actually like 100% Java compatible, so you can totally use it from Java. It's like the same kind of code. Um, all right, finally, um, servers in Finagle. Um, and servers are very, very simple in Finagle. They're like really simple. They optimize for high throughput, and they don't do anything extra, almost anything extra, on top of just handling the common request. And that kind of makes a lot of sense, because when you're a server and you've got a request, there is nothing to think about. You just handle it and move along, right? But there is slightly complicated logic inside server to, um, to accommodate that. And basically, by default, every Finagle server does um, three simple things. It do metrics and tracing for you, so it's easy to, develop, to, uh, to debug production issues and monitor your components. Um, it enforces really simple request handle time, timeout, and also maintains the request concurrency limit. And um, that's basically it. There is nothing much server left to do because it's just like straightforward. You've got a request, you handle that. Um, so here's how you can override the concurrency limit on, on your server. You can say that um, I want to handle at, at, at max 10 requests at once, and there's like zero waiters uh, allowed for my server, and um, there's like a super straightforward API to do that. And the concurrency limit and everything on top of that 10 requests will be rejected by your server and hopefully will be retried by a client that talks to your server. But we don't know that for sure. But anyways, we just reject them. And the concurrency limit is one of the um, forms of admission control we support for servers in Finagle. And when I say admission control, I mean some kind of feedback control from the underlying system that you can use to figure out if you have enough resources to handle the incoming request. And if you don't have them, you just reject that. And this is really useful for servers to not like overwhelm um, their selves. And um, for example, another form of admission control we are experimenting right now is, uh, and it's not included in our open source fork because it's highly tied to the infrastructure when we, where we run our services, which is Mesos. And, um, so the admission control is called throttling-based admission control, and by name it's kind of like known what it do. Uh, basically what it's trying to do, it monitors Mesos metrics and try to predict a time when, it, when a replica, when your server is about to get throttled by, by Mesos, and it starts rejecting requests to prevent that. Basically it like, it's really, really useful to, to protect yourself from, high, from huge spikes in traffic, and instead of like slowing down 100% of requests, you just reject 25% of them and keep operating normally. And this is a really, really nice feature because um, sometimes it even helps you to stay within the SLOs, so you don't have to, for example, with throttling-based admission control, the worst case scenario you can get is you, um, if you're disabled, you can get the entire cluster um, restarted because every single node there will, will, be, will be throttled. But with throttling-based admission control, you just sort of like reject some amount of requests, some kind of failures you send to your clients, but you keep operating normally and you keep serving traffic, at least 75% of traffic, you do that. And this is really, really useful thing. Um, and another interesting part I wanted to mention is um, it's not really like admission control. It's something, something slightly different, but we've been also experimenting with that. And it's called uh, GC avoidance. So the thing is, uh, you sort of like do the same thing, but instead of monitoring Mesos metrics, you monitor your GC activities. And when you can predict that your node is about to get um, to go for a long GC pause, you can start rejecting traffic to prevent that. Or you can just say your server saying that 
hey, I want to spend some time doing GC. Can you, not, can you not send some requests to me for that time? And this is really useful. It's not enabled by default for us, but we're trying to experiment with that as well. Um, and if you want to talk about that more, I, we can chat about afterwards. I can, I can teach you how to enable that. Um, so what else? The request timeout is really a simple thing. You just say, how much time do you want to spend handling the request? And if you weren't able to, if you weren't able to handle that in 42 seconds, you just time out that. And it's a really interesting part. Um, all right, clients. Clients are really, really smart. They like much more complicated than servers. And even if, even if compared to that servers that can uh, sort of monitor Mesos metrics and do stuff like that, it's still really stupid compared to clients. So, and clients do as much as possible to make sure that your request will succeed in the least possible time. So they maximize success rate and minimize latency. But servers are optimized for high throughput, so there's nothing much we can do. And in clients, we can do a lot to make sure that um, success rate is maximum and latency is minimum. And this is basically the list of features uh, client supports. <laughs> we won't be able to talk about everything here, but we will try to cover like highlighted parts. And uh, before doing that, let's just go through every item here and see if we understand why we actually need that. <laughs> so the retry model is actually pretty straightforward. You want to be able to retry failed requests to make sure that success, success rate is, is, is high. And to do that, it's actually a really tricky problem because you have to answer a bunch of tricky, tr tricky questions. For example, how do I say if request failed? Or how do I say if it's safe to retry? Or for example, if you already did try it once, the question is, should they keep retrying? Or should they stop? Should they just drop it? And stuff like that. This is a really tricky problem. And retries um, are enabled by default. And every Finagle client, you usually shouldn't care about that much. Um, what else? We have to be able to help services locate each other. So there is a built-in service discovery and naming uh, tool inside Finagle. Uh, inside Finagle client, so basically you get that for free. And if you want to get more, uh, you want to know more about that. I highly recommend watching Marius's talk from the most recent Finagle con. It's called RPC Redux, and it covers naming and service discovery part really well. Um, so we want to make sure we we can overwrite timeouts and expiration inside the client, so we can sort of like um, put the bounds in, in, into our distributed system, into components and distributed system. We also make sure, the most interesting part, we also want to make sure that we can distribute traffic across um, a number of instances where our software is deployed and load managers solve that inside every Finical client. Um, what we also can do, we can do rate limiting. And, and that actually really depends on what you want to try to do. For example, you can talk to some external API that rate limits you. You can make sure your Finagle client doesn't exceed that. You can configure that and make sure you still keep um, getting the traffic to, through that API. Um, you can do connection pooling. It's enabled by default for every single Finagle client, uh, except for the max one, because it doesn't actually make sense to have that for multiplexing protocols. Um, you can do circuit breaker and failure detection for free, and Finagle does that. Um, so why we need that is we want to make sure we, we um, keep, uh, we, we want to make sure we take care about unreliable replicas, nodes inside your cluster. So we want to exclude them from the load balancer set so we don't set traffic on the, on, onto that nodes. It does metrics and tracing for you for free in the same way uh, servers does. So you can monitor some kind of like success rate, how many requests you've got, what's the latency of requests and stuff like that. It's really, really useful. Um, and the last two is really uh, tricky questions here, and most of the people don't care about them, but we do care, and Finagle does support that. And um, so interrupts, why we need interrupts? We need to uh, make sure that we do not do some useless work, and we want to make sure we have support for canceling requests. So, and so the problem is, you might think, why would they cancel the request? Why would they do that? I just send it crap. I want that handled. But um, that's actually happened implicitly for you. For example, let's imagine you have a client and you set up a timeout for that. And after a given amount of time, it expires. And what Finagle does, it interrupts the future associated with that request. And it gets propagated across the service boundaries. And it will interrupt the request you just sent. And it actually really, really depends on the protocol you use. And Finagle will take care about that. So the worst case scenario for HTTP, for example, there is nothing we can do, just cut the connection. But for some more advanced protocol like Max, 
we can actually try to cancel that. We can send a low-level signal to a server saying that, hey, I'm no longer interested in the result of that request I just sent you, so you should feel free to drop that. And we do that today, and we do that for, for Max. Um, and you, if you use Max to treat Max, you should get that for free. And um, <coughs> the context propagation is kind of a similar thing, and the idea is um, you want to make sure that you can attach some um, additional information to your request, like trace ID, like client ID, request ID, anything you want to uh, you want to do. And basically, Finagle takes care about that. It gets serialized, serialized and deserialized depending on the protocol you use, and, and sort of like propagates over the wire between different services, and you can sort of pull up that information anytime you want, and you will get that um, explicitly for your request. And this is really is useful for tracing, for example. And um, so the last two is actually really good reason for us to um, still like our futures better, because they support that, and Scala Futures doesn't actually do that for you. Um, all right, so um, before we start about talking in deep details about Finagle uh, client models, we can talk about this interesting problem in this poll. And the problem is how come HTTP 500 considers success in Finagle? So um, who thinks it's a bug? Nobody thinks it's a bug. OK. Uh, that's actually right, because it's not a bug. Um, the idea is, um, as you remember, Finagle operates on layer 5 of the OSI model, so it knows nothing about the protocol application it used by. And basically, when it sees uh, an HTTP, HTTP response 500, it sees the correctly structured HTTP message. And it looks like success to Finagle. And that's actually a pretty big deal, because um, first of all, our metrics messed up, because success rate looks like 100%, but we are serving failures, basically. And the second part is, um, Finagle load balancers go crazy about that, because if a server responds really quickly and the response looks like success, load balancer thinks, well, it might be a good idea to send more traffic to that replica, because it's doing a really great job. And in fact, not, because it's serving failures. And to solve that, it's been a problem quite a long time. And to solve that, we have this really new, exciting feature called, uh, it's called response classifiers. So um, it means that you can actually plug in um, into a Finagle client some sort of like a partial function saying, uh, saying what kind of request should be treated as success, what kind of request should be treated as failures, and you can teach Finagle how to, how to behave on that kind of request. And this is really useful. For example, here you can define um, response classifier that treats 503 servers unavailable as a non-retriable failure. So which means that when you've got that response from, from a server, uh, the circuit breaker will kick in and um, sort of like disable that replica for some time to make sure that it gets to a normal state before, before you can retry that request. And it's really useful. Um, right, so finally, how do we do retries? So basically, um, You've got retry model on the very, very top of the stack, so you can retry everything underneath. And basically, for, for example, you can retry failures from circuit breakers, from timeouts, from uh, load balancer. And that makes a lot of sense. If you happen to pick a replica that rejected the request by some reason, we don't know which, for example, it might be going to for admission control, Mesos uh, traveling or something like that. And if you reject the request, it makes a lot of sense to retry that on a different replica. And retries actually do that for you. Um, and by default, Finagle retries only when it's absolutely safe to do, when it's absolutely known that your request wasn't written to a wire yet, for example, or um, when remote server reject that. So you know that if you retry that, it's going to be fine. Not, nothing is going to be break. <laughs> and um, it uses some interesting, um, interesting techniques to make sure you prevent retry storms, basically, which means retrying too much. And um, there's this abstraction called retry bucket, sorry, retry budget, which is basically um, a leaky token bucket, and it ties total number of requests to um, number of retries you have. So you can have some sort of like manageable upper bound on total number of retries you have. And you will be a good citizen in your system because you don't, you won't overwhelm underlying, underlying services because of retries. And also, what it also do for you is um, there's a back off policy you can override. And it basically answers the question how long to wait 
between retries, like should I retry immediately, should I wait some time, and the back off policy does it for you. And so b both those abstractions are quite useful to mitigate retry storms, and that's, that's what we use today, and that's really, really helpful. Um, for example, you can define retry budget in, in a way like this. You're saying, I want to make sure that I retry no more than 10% of total number of requests, and on top of five retries per second to accommodate clients with low RPS. And, um, and the nice thing about that, as I said, you can actually share that instance with, for example, different finagle components and make sure they don't cause retry storms. For example, you can build uh, your own retry filter that retries uh, failures from your domain application, and you can use the same instance of the retry badges there. It's straight safe, and um, you will get the manageable upper bound of total number of retries, so you should feel safe about your client not retrying too much. It's really useful. Um, so the back off policy is, um, defines the behavior of the retry client, saying how long to wait between retry attempts. And basically a stream of duration, which is really nice because you can plug in your own thing really easily because we know how to work with uh, streams and Scala collections, stuff like that. And we also provide a bunch of predefined policies as well. And the most useful of them is um, uh, the one that jittered. So the idea is um, for quite often you have uh, a bunch of clients talking to a single server, and that server might behave, uh, might perform really poorly under high contention. And you want to make sure that clients started at the same time. If they're going to try, if they go going to retry, they should re shouldn't retry at the same time. So we want to reduce contention between them, and we want to make sure they don't compete with each other. So to do that, we just add some sort of like randomized factor into any, into every retry, into any um, duration in the back half. So we want to make sure that clients do not compete with each other. And jitter back halves do that for you. And you can use any of the predefined policies here. And um, the most interesting part is that Finagle does that for free for most of its components, but not for, um, not for, for retry policies. And for retries, you can override that using saying something like, I want to use exponential jitters starting at two seconds and ending at 32 seconds. And what it means in practice, you will be retrying at random of two seconds, random of four seconds, and so on and so forth, up to 32 seconds. And you will make sure that your clients do not compete with each other on each retry to, to a single server. <laughs> right, so um, now that we know how to retry, we want to make sure that there is something we can retry to. And um, uh, one of the ways to do that is to overwrite some, some timeouts in your client. And this is, um, there is a hell of a ground timeout you can overwrite in Finagle. You can overwrite TCP timeout. You can overwrite session acquisition timeout, session max lifetime, session max idle time, and stuff like that. And this is really useful. And um, none of that is um, over overridden by default. Finagle is trying to not speculate on application level um, values, so it doesn't overwrite anything like that. There is no retry, uh, sorry, there is no request timeout by default. There is no concurrency limit by default. There is no um, um, any kind of session timeout by default. You have to be explicit about that, and it should be tied to your domain, to your application, and things like that. Finagle is not speculating on those values. Um, Finally, um, the most interesting part, load balancing in Finagle, which I think the most advanced thing in, in Finagle at all. So um, first of all, to understand how this thing works in Finagle is that um, the important part here is there's a deep-seated assumption inside Finagle. It was designed on top of this idea that uh, your server set is basically a replica set, which means every single node in your, ser in your, in your server set is actually equivalent from the point of view of your application. So you can totally retry any kind of request you've got onto any different replica you have, and you should feel free to distribute traffic uniformly and do not tie to any kind of replica in your server set. And Finagle comes with a bunch of load balancing options, different, and um, it might be viewed as a combination of two different components. Uh, we've got load distributor and load factor. Basically, we, what, what we do is we distribute traffic across some subset of nodes and then pick the one for which the load metric is minimal. And that's what general load balancer does for Finagle. And um, in order to understand 
what kind of load balancers we have in Finagle right now, I think it makes a lot of sense to have a look at the evolution of load balancer in Finagle. And in the early days, we had this very simple thing. It was called heap load balancer. And it's built on top of min heap um, that maintains number of outstanding requests per each node in, in your cluster. And it's really simple and straightforward. And so when you make a request, you just pick a root because it's a minimal value, and then you rebuild the entire heap. And um, it works really well, and it worked really well for us for some time. And at some point, we figured out a couple of drawbacks that solution had. Um, first of all, when you think about load balancer, and the load balancer state is a highly contended resource, it should be really fast, and it should scale, scale uh, really, really well, because you have to update that on every single request. And you might get like a million of those requests every second. And the heap is really, really fast on one hand, but um, you can take the minimum element in, in a constant time. But Every other operation takes logarithmic time to perform. And this is a big deal because you are not able to implement any kind of sophisticated load metric on top of that because uh, it, would be, it would just sacrifice the performance of the heap. And with large server set, when there is like a several thousands of nodes in your heap, it might be a big deal. And that's what we've noticed before. And the next thing we try to build um, instead of the heap balancer is called um, power of two choices. It's basically really, really nice and brilliant mathematical idea. And um, it's, uh, the load balancer algorithm basically picks two nodes from the server set like randomly and picks the least loaded one. And by repeatedly applying that strategy on your server set, you will get manageable upper bound of load per each node, which is exactly what we need when we want to do load balancer and load balancing. And we want to make sure that every single node in your cluster will get a uniform sort of like uniform load. And um, B2C works really well because it scales really nice. It's just a array you have to update. You can do that in constant time. And that allows it to build um, some kind of sophisticated load metrics, not just least loaded, but something more interesting. And um, the most advanced load metric we have today is called EWMA, which stands for Exponentially Weighted Moving Average. And it basically, for every single node in your cluster, it keeps track of the round trip latency weighted by the number of outstanding, uh, outstanding requests per each node. And um, this is sort of like smart, because being on layer five of the OSI model, it kind of makes sense to uh, take an advantage of both RPC uh, latency and RPC queue depth. And the, this metric does it for you. And which means it's really sensitive to latency spikes. And that makes it really, really nice tool if you want to protect yourself from long GC pauses or JVM warm ups. Because if you happen to pick a metrica, sorry, if you happen to pick a replica that just went for a long GC pause, that metric will reflect that immediately. And your load balancer will avoid that node for some time, giving it a chance actually to finish GC. And the same thing happens if, you're, um, if you just start new servers and JVM needs some time to warm up. And that, that metrica helps prevent it's like huge load on that metric. So huge load on that replica, giving it some time to actually um, finish those. And um, so let's look at the comparison of those three different options we've, we've seen before. That's really interesting. So we've got round robin, which is like stupidest algorithm error. And we've got um, P2C plus, plus least loaded and P2C plus EWMA. And here we run a simulation when one client talks to 11 different servers and each server replaces a latency profile captured from, from a production system with no significant spikes. But at some point, we fix the latency of one of the servers to two seconds, simulating long GC pause. And um, we want to make sure that we want to we want to measure sort of like total client latency from that client. And we use different load, load balancing strategies. And what we see here is <clears throat> so round robin behaves really, really bad. It goes to more than one, uh, one and a half seconds at P99. And um, least load is doing much better until doing much better um, in mitigating latency spikes until P99. And um, EWMA doing this great job in uh, maintaining low latency until 99 and 9 percent, which is, which is, and there is a huge difference between those three. And for example, in, um, usually we tie, uh, latency with failures with timeouts in distributed systems. And if you say timeout is going to be one second for that client, uh, we will get different success rate for those three options. And with round robin, you will get success rate 95%. With list loaded, it's going to be 99. And with EWMA, it's going to be 99.9. .9. 
and there is a huge difference between those because with first two you will likely to get page probably at night and with EWMA you will be sleeping like a baby. Um, that's, that's a good selling point actually. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. And if you think that EWMA is the most advanced load balancer you've, seen, you've seen so far, you're probably wrong because the, we've got something really, really cool inside Finagle and it's called Aperture. So, um, and what, what it does is it's trying to solve the problem of large server sets, large clusters. And what happens in practice, you may have one client talking to um, several thousands of servers, and which usually result in several thousands of open connections and, several, and low concurrency level per each node in, in, you, in your load balancer. And that's actually quite a big problem. So why it's a problem is um, why number of connections matter? Well, that's easy. It's just um, waste of resources, and it usually comes with the cost of long tail latency because of high number of connection establishment, which usually takes much longer than just send a request. And um, why concurrency matter? And uh, it's actually really interesting because in order to take an advantage of any load balancer metric, we need some numbers to work with. We need something. And when concurrency is low, there is, everything is zero. Number of outstanding requests per, e per each node is zero. And there is nothing we can do to advise load balancer how to, how to make sure that you, you, you made the right choice. And um, sort of to solve that, we are trying to view the cluster set, the replica set you have like a huge replica set from a small, fr through the small window called Aperture. And in that window, you can actually apply any kind of load balancer you have today in Finagle. You can apply to see EW, you may get, and get the best latency profile error. And um, that actually works pretty well. And um, it means you've got less connection for, from client, less connections from server, you get better latency profile, uh, you get better tail latency, especially. And um, what it does, it uses some kind of feedback controller from the underlying system, and it tries to adjust your aperture size to make sure that every node inside your aperture will be getting constant load between the boundaries you, you, you set in the very beginning. And this is really nice because it keeps every single replica inside your aperture in the warm state. So everything is up, everything is running, and uh, it works really, really great. Um, Here's, so Aperture is not default today. It's sort of like still experimental, but you can try to enable that um, in your servers. And uh, what you can do, for example, you can say, I want to make sure that uh, I start with uh, Aperture size 10, which means 10 nodes in your cluster set. And I want to make sure that every single node inside my replica set is getting, um, constantly getting load between one and two uh, concurrent requests. And the aperture will try to adjust your windows starting from 10. It might shrink, it might widen that to make sure that every single node is getting that kind of load there. And it's really interesting, um, the dynamic approach. Um, finally, so now that we know how load balancers works, we want to make sure that we exclude some bad replicas from your server set and we don't set traffic to um, unreliable nodes in, on your cluster. And um, Finagle uses circuit breaker for that and there is a layer underneath a uh, load balancer, and they can disable uh, some of the nodes from the, sort of like exclude some of the nodes from replica set, so you don't send, you don't send traffic to them. And we've got three of them implemented right now. Um, the, the simplest and the most straightforward one is fail fast, which basically disable your session if you fail to do TCP connect, and try to retry TCP connect after a given amount of time. You can override the uh, back off policy for that as well. Um, the next one is called failure curl. It's actually a really, really smart thing and the most advanced circuit breaker we have today. And it has like pluggable policies. We, we will see later how to configure that. And the last one is called threshold failure detector, which is basically a ping-based failure detector. And we support that for protocols that support low-level uh, session liveness detection signals like MAX or HTTP2 will support that. And the idea is really simple. You just send a ping and measure the latency which takes to get a pong from, from, your, from your server. And you, you, if you, and you try to, to answer a question whether or not that latency is good or bad. And if it's bad, you just say that, load, that node is unreliable. I'm going to exclude that from the replica set for, for some time. And then I'm going to try back. Um, and everything is retriable here. So um, circuit breakers, they don't just exclude something like for 
unlimited time. They try to retry after a given amount of time so we can go back to normal state if, if, um, if it's possible to do. And so let's talk about failure accrual just uh, for a bit. Um, so this is the most advanced circuit breaker we have. And the, in the way that it supports pluggable policies, you can plug it into and teach it how to, uh, how to treat your responses and, how to, and, whether, and when to disable your, your session, basically. And right now, we have two different policies available. So the first one is um, success rate based. So you basically can say what, kind of, what, what success rate you expect for, um, from every single node. And if it goes below that value, it will be the replica will be, dis will be disabled, will be excluded for some time. You can also say uh, how many consecutive failures you can get from a replica, and if it's greater than some number, you can disable that as well. And by default, um, every, uh, by default, it uses the policy, when it sees five failures by the same node, it will disable that and goes to uh, jitter it back off to re-enable that again and try again. And for example, you can override that and say, I want to make sure that success rate is going to be at least 95%. And if it's less than that value, the node for every particular node, so it keep, keeps track of success rate for every node in your cluster, it will be disabled from, it will be excluded from the server set you load balance, balance over. Um, this is a really useful thing, actually. Um, so what else? Um, let's see. Finagle is actually really, really rich in terms of ecosystem, you've got so many different libraries that do so many different things. Uh, for example, you can do tracing via Zipkin, which is enabled by default. Uh, you can do HTTP admin interface and metrics, collect metrics, see some charts, um, do some profiling, see like flame grass and stuff like that using Twitter server. Uh, you can use library called Finatra, which is like sort of like HTTP framework you can use to build um, REST services on top of Finagle. And, um, or even, even Thrift services as well. And you can use something like Finch or Source type level libraries to build sort of like purely functional endpoints uh, on top of Finagle that will be served inside the Finagle ecosystem. Or there is a new library called um, Featherbed, which means, and you can use that to build sort of like type level HTTP clients, and use a shapeless, uh, use a Source as well, and make sure that. Um, you actually doing uh, sort of like HTTP REST API calls in a type safe manner. And there's many, many more on, on the GitHub page. So you should feel free to, to go there and check out what Finagle can do for you. And I hope that was quite useful. And that's the GitHub page for Finagle. Uh, feel free to give it a star, file a ticket, uh, send a few requests. We, we are totally welcoming those. Thank you very much. That's all. Um, if you, have, if you have any questions or if you need a Finagle t-shirt, I have some. But, so, but first come, first serve, I guess just a few of them. So any, any questions so far? Oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Can you elaborate a bit on the power to uh, system you're talking about? Yeah, power to, power to choices. Yeah, so there is a, um, that's really interesting. There is a computer science paper written in 2001, and it says that uh, we are trying to utilize some randomized algorithm for load balancer. And basically the idea is um, if you have a large server set, you can pick two of, no of the nodes and then pick the least loaded one. And if you repeatedly apply that like several, several times, you will get manageable upper bound on your load. So you won't get a situation when one of the nodes getting like much more traffic. There is an upper bound on that, which is actually logarithm of logarithm of n per each node. And there is like actually um, sort of a proof for that. So it's like mathematically stable model. And it's really useful because you can do that in constant time. That's why it's so powerful. That's what it's called, power of? Power of two choices, yeah. You, yeah, you just can, you can, you can Google that, saying like power of two choices. Yeah. Uh, I realize the point about Finagle isn't just speech related. How would Finagle be, and I'm asking this in the context if I'd like to use this for something important, how would Finagle be sending very large data sets, like, like let's say five to 10 gigabytes of data, um, or like streaming connections? Um, um, right, so, so you, you said Finagle HTTP related in the? No, no, I'm saying I realize Finagle's not just HTTP. Right. 
Exactly. So Finagle is like protocol agnostic, which means you can build anything you want on top of that. And we have a bunch of different protocols implemented already. And um, if you want to do streaming, for example, for like large uh, payloads, you can totally use HTTP. Finagle does support that. You can, you can stream HTTP uh, chunks. You can also use something like Triffmax, and there is a quite exciting recent feature, feature we did is basically you can stream, H, you can stream uh, Triffmax payload through, through the Max connection. Yeah, so basically it's Trift, uh, just regular Trift, but it works on top of that protocol I was describing. It's called Max, and it doesn't use like, it's like a multiplexing protocol. It uses one connection per endpoint per, per, per server. In your, in your cluster, and it's like really, really powerful in terms of like streaming data. It can dechunk your payload and send it like in, 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 in small chunks if you have a large one, for example. Yeah, uh, anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, does client work with Scala.js? Uh, does client work with Scala.js? I don't think so. Um, we've never tried to enable that. I guess there's something you should do with uh, your SBT build, right, to make sure it works. Um, yeah, we, we didn't do that, but we welcome pull requests. If you want to do that, if you want to try, should feel free. Yeah. Um, anything else? I guess that's it. So feel free to reach out if you have any extra questions. Totally happy to chat. Thank you.